Hi, I'm Rigger. This is your right. Today we're addressing a quick theory for Volume 9. I'll say up front that this has spoilers in it for Chapter 3, so make sure you're all caught up. But I think the best way to handle this is just to dive into it. Basically, I think we now have a much better idea of what might happen with Neo. Not just how everything happens, but what might even happen to her in the end. Stick around to the end of the video. Because we are going all the way with this one. If you've seen my thoughts video for this chapter, you already know where this is going, or at least where it's starting, but I will build off it a bit more than what was in that video. The thought did come to me while I was going over my review of that episode, and I've built on it a little bit further. And I thought that now it really deserved its own little separate video, so that's what this is. But basically, to start off at the end of chapter 3, we get this big moment where we're reintroduced to Neo. She crashes down. And... Not only when she lands does she confront the Jabberwalker, but something crazy happens. After she becomes Ruby and Cinder, seemingly due to overwhelming rage, causing her semblance to just be going out of control, and she's just becoming the people that she's picturing in her mind, apparently with hate, and who could blame her from her perspective? And then she starts summoning a copy of herself. Alright, usually at first glance that would be a weird thing, but with Neo that seems about right. It's always been a little difficult to define exactly how her semblance in combat works, but we do know for a fact she can make illusory stand-ins of herself. There's direct reference to that. I know it's referenced in the book as well. So yeah, she can do this. That's normal-ish. What perhaps isn't normal is that Neo is somewhat surprised, as if this is happening almost spontaneously, and then another Neo appears. And another. And pretty soon there's quite a few of them. And not only are there a few of them, but while they start off mimicking Neo's movements, they quickly stop and each individually act. And Neo sends them to attack the Jabberwalker. And they act with a variety of expressions and different approaches, as if each were an actual separate Neo. Well, they're not. They aren't actually her. They're not flesh and blood. But they are acting as if they are her. That she isn't making real clones, obviously, but it seems like she is imbuing them with her personality, and they all can act slightly different. That they're not just acting as her puppets, they have some sort of influence on them of the personality that they were made with. Now, I'm not beyond saying that she perhaps even had this ability before, that when she sent in copies of herself to fight, or when she'd summoned copies of herself in the past, that they had a personality to them, because they acted as her. She wasn't puppeting them off from the side doing the same fight moves as them. However, this is multiples of them, and multiples acting just slightly differently enough that they are not just robots following the same exact pattern and the same exact instruction in the same exact way. They essentially all had multiple personalities at the same time, despite the fact that it was the same personality. Sure, they're all her, and they're all acting as Neo, but they're all acting separately, and this is key. And this is key because I'm not going to bury the lead on this one because I have a lot of explaining to do with some other things, because what I think is, this is the explanation for what we see with Neo in the opening. We see this here. This shot of Neo looking like a boss and obviously being a Mad Hatter homage with the T. But since it's appeared, the question has been, well, who are these people? And the honest answer is that some of them at least seem pretty obvious. The two on either side really seem to be her parents. Like, not just, like, their demeanor, and also it makes sort of sense that they would be close to her like that, and look at the supportive hand on her chair. If you were to pick people who might be standing either side of her supporting her, her parents are probably a good pick. And the one behind her is just absolutely Roman. It is from his pose, you can tell. And of course, he would be the one directly behind her. Here, I actually uh, tortured the levels out of this image to make it easy to see. Excuse the blinding light that's incoming. So, here. Uh, the colors were inverted and I cranked around some of the blues. That's absolutely Roman's hair hanging down in front of his face on the side. Also, I'm going to switch the image again. There will also be another blinding light in the middle. I apologize. There's that. This is with the other levels cranked. And that lets you see the other figures a lot better here. So you can see, like, their hairstyles. You can see this guy's spiky hair, who kind of looks like Crow if he went insane or something, with the hunched-over conniving pose, but all their spiky hair slicked back. And then this one, who I really thought might be Tyrion, but perhaps not, because he seems to have more, like, hair pulled back over the top of his head, which usually you can't see on Tyrion, but who knows. And this one, and the height and everything, really makes me think this one is Cinder. 
etc etc you get the point i don't know who all of these are but you can see more details of them in this image outside of the parents and roman i'm less sure i mean i think that one might be sin that's what i'm holding out for but the other ones no idea i'm not going to pretend that i do but it begs the question how do these people get here whoever they are how did they get here well before the volume there was lots of talk that perhaps the afterlife is here because there's lots of themes to do with that and lots of people that died and there's certainly recognizable dead figures here. I mean, that must be it. Roman is dead. Except it's not. That's not it. Because I posit to you that the truth behind this is that it's not the dead at all, and it's not these people here. Instead, it's just Neo. All of them. Every single one here is Neo. Okay, so calling them Neo might basically be incorrect. What I mean is, all of this was made by Neo. This is Neo using her new ability to make all these people. People from her past. Just like this, except instead of making a load of copies of herself, she makes individual copies of these people and imbues them with whatever personality she can give them. That is Neo's false fairy tale. I'll get to why this happens soon, but first let's justify the approach. So first of all, we have this whole mob boss thing going on, right? The cool mood, the cool nod, the shadowy gang. Plus, we can easily gain an understanding from Neo's life that this is something she probably wants. She's always been the henchman. Sure, we can call her time with Roman more than being a henchman. It's more of a partnership there, there's a lot more to it than just being a henchman. But after being alone, and sad, and miserable, and angry it seems, she returns and begins working with Cinder. But quickly, it becomes clear she's not working with Cinder, she's working for Cinder. And she doesn't seem happy about that. Then, she gets brought to Salem, who Neo, even Neo, can't fight. And she's talked about like she's an asset. She's talked down to by Tyrion. She's sent on missions like a henchman. And finally, when she breaks away from that, soon enough, well, she's back needing to work with Cinder and Watts again. So, back to basically being a henchman. And she's outright betrayed at the end of that one. So, it's not a stretch to assume Neo would like to be a boss. She likes the crime life, it's for her, and she's good at it. But being a boss with her own gang for a change sounds really great. So, behind her, this is her gang. Right? This image, it portrays like a mob boss with a gang behind them. So what does Neo do when she lands, and her semblance appears and the Jabberwalker approaches? She snaps her fingers like a mob boss and sends her gang on their prey. So. This is her gang, and this is her gang. So saying they're made the same way would not be a stretch to fulfill the same role. Also, of course, symbolically, look, now Neo is in the spotlight for once. And also, while we're on that, it has nothing to do with the theory. I just wanted to point it out. Has anyone pointed out this similarity yet? Because, I don't know, I just realized it, like, today, and I thought it was cool. But anyway, moving on with the actual theory. Next off, we have more symbolism. Behind Neo, of these people? They are shadows, right? Sure, it's to hide them from us, but literally, they're shadows of her past. People she's left behind one way or another. People she has memories of. Which is why I'd bet that this one over here is actually trivia. It's herself. As if she'd grown up. This is what she thinks she would be now. These ones I'm not sure on still, but they could be anyone from her past. And perhaps people who've read the book can throw some names out if you have some ideas. But the point still stands. If this is Cinder, which the hair, the stance, and the clothing, and the height really say it might be, I mean, the hair isn't exactly right, but it's pretty close, because it doesn't have the spikes on the back of the neck, but it does have the swoop, and it's the right... Look, there's a lot about this that makes me think it's Cinder. But either way, if you could make your own gang of people, like, if you had that ability, why wouldn't you put in someone you hate, and order them around, and be a boss, make their life hell? Hell, you can even smash the thing when you're mad at it and then make another one. Why wouldn't you order around them? You know, why wouldn't Neo just order around Cinder like a servant if she could? Not all of them need to be sentimental. Like, obviously there's Roman and the parents and possibly Trivia. All those very sentimental to her. But that doesn't mean that all of them have to be. And if that is the case, I'm surprised there actually isn't a ruby in here. But A, that'd be too obvious we'd all pick the silhouette immediately. And B, Neo knows while well, Ruby is down here too, so she isn't exactly in the past yet, she can still get her, whereas Cinder might not see her again. So that's the motivation down, 
for Neo doing this. The next question is, if that is the case, would they act like themselves? And from what I can see, yes and no. It would be Neo creating them from memory. It would be her imbuing them with the emotion she has towards that person and what she remembers them as being, and also perhaps if she wants to change anything, I suppose. And we see an ability to imbue these copies separately with functioning personalities already. They're just all Neo. So why can't that be combined with her ability to make them appear or make herself appear as other people? So, put the two together, they appear as other people and have the personality she can put in them. It's not herself this time. Her treasured memories of Roman pushed into this image of him to the point where it's almost given life, seemingly. I mean, perhaps not quite, but as close as you can possibly get. Also, I think it's really sweet that he doesn't have his hat, because presumably Neo could have given him one in the illusion, but there's only one true hat and it's the one she has. In fact, she may even go up and give it back to him in a lovely moment. That could be really cool. But for, say, Cinder, not so much. If it is Cinder, I'm just assuming. But in that, she'd probably take joy in creating this one as a subservient minion. It probably wouldn't exactly act like her. Although if it acted out and hated what it did, that would probably be more on brand. We also have the question of weapons, right? If these things are here and the team might even have to fight them, do they have their weapons? Well, Neo's copies had theirs, it didn't seem as functional as hers, they didn't open them, but as far as something to hit you with, yeah. And we have seen that Neo's copies can hold proper fights for a while. They do break eventually, so presumably these can take some hits and dish them out. They are solid, and they have a few hit points, I guess. And they have Neo's skill, or whatever skills she puts in them, seemingly if, if this theory holds true. So they can avoid hits pretty well because of Neo's incredible talent. But one would think that it has its limits, of course, so Cinder's not going to be having maiden powers if it is her, but I'm sure a sword would do. Same for Roman, his cane, although it probably wouldn't have its projectile functionality. I don't think it would work as a firearm, it'd be melee only. Without ammunition, I don't know how you could illusion a firearm and turn it into a working, you know, weapon. So, just like other people's semblances. I don't think if it was Cinder, let's say, because we know her semblance, I don't think that's going to happen. So it'd be Cinder without fire. But yeah, they should be relatively fightable, especially with melee weapons, and at least whatever personality Neo can give them. So the only other thing I don't know, and I can't imagine, is the case of... Well, there's no other way to talk about it. Unless this semblance has evolved like crazy, will they talk? And I really, 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 really doubt it. Even removing the Neo being mute thing, it would be crazy strong to develop the ability to mimic someone's voice. That makes it incredibly powerful. And it also makes it weird if Neo doesn't speak, but the copies can. And then the implications of, well, it removes the thing that makes Neo unique in that way by just having her copies talk for her. So no, I don't think that's going to happen. It wouldn't make sense for it to happen, it would be distracting for it to happen, so as far as... The reason I bring it up is as far as personality goes, I think it's going to have to stop at just the movements and the expressions, which admittedly will rob Torchwick of a lot of his charm in his reappearance. I mean, don't start about the voice actor thing, they can always recast, that's not the issue. It's that without his silver tongue and dialogue, he'll probably lessen the impact of him being there, but it's probably for the best overall because he isn't the point of everything. And it might even be really weirder and creepier if the gang arrive and see this guy that they think is dead, and he's standing there and it's clearly him, and he's just being silent. Especially when you knew he was so talkative. But also, for something like Torchwick, it means they don't have to deal with the recasting thing. Even though I don't consider it an issue whatsoever, it might, you know, distract the audience a little bit and... Rather than deal with that at all, they just have a good excuse to not even bother having to do the recast. So, anyway, that's done. Let's get into more evidence. So, a few things. This room we're looking at, because I thought I might as well have a little bit of a deeper dive in the room. So, this is her gang, but I think this is also her room, or like, her headquarters. Because, in fact, I think she's going to get a headquarters like this. Let me explain. First off, let's look at the colours. There's pink and brown and white. And even the table is brown and white. So, let's examine this pattern and the wall panels. Obviously, again, Neo's colours everywhere, in broad strokes, but they are. 
And now this pattern here, it's not perfectly matching her umbrella, but it's in that style. It's that, that definite gilded style. And thematically, it fits pretty strongly with her, well, again, to use the same word, style. And that is also reflected in her mug. Again, it's her colors in the draping pattern with the diamonds. So again, even with all the flowers and everything, you have her colors everywhere. They're all through this room. And even the table, clearly a wooden table with something over it, uh, perhaps a, a tablecloth, or it almost looks like it's been partly covered in marble. It's hard to say, but either way, it has white and brown, which are two of her colors. And I couldn't help but feel that this pattern was familiar, and the, this is the best I could get with it. It's a shattering pattern. It's sort of random, but it feels like, like shattering. Now, we're in Through the Looking Glass, because we're in the sequel to Alice in Wonderland, if Weiss was correct. So, mirrors can shatter, of course, and we have lots of mirror-mirror themes in Ruby. But also, well, the famous shattering thing is Remnant's Moon. That's shattered, although I don't know how relevant that is. But also, oh yeah, Neo is the one character who also shatters. It's not exactly the same, and maybe it's nothing, and maybe it's reaching, but I did notice it was there. So maybe, again, it's, it could represent also her shattered mind, because there's a lot of Mad Hatter in here, and we'll talk a bit about the madness aspect later. It will come up. Either way, the point is, I noticed, and everything in here fits her scheme, fits her themes, fits her feel. So... I believe, yeah, this is her room, and I think it might be legit that it's not just for the opening, there might actually be a place like this. There is also the craziest option on how that happens, which is that Neo creates it, that she can create an illusory house, a literal house of illusion that is also full of walking illusions. Now, you might think that's way too powerful and way too far, but while I would normally agree with you, I think in this case, perhaps not, because there is a chance, and this is... Again, like additional notes, I'm not saying this is definitely the case, but the other idea is the reason Neo can do all this, even that her semblance is evolving so powerfully, and that she is so powerful, and has seemed to have just gotten even stronger, despite the fact she was just in a fight, technically, like before she fell, is that Ever After is helping her, perhaps even fueling her aura magically, boosting her semblance's potential, because... The story wants its pieces, it wants its characters playing their roles, and it will provide to make it happen. There is a lot of magic in Ever After. Have you seen what everyone's been doing? Jinxie can make full illusions. The prince can shrink people at will and throw tables with magic. The cat can decapitate itself and teleport seemingly anywhere. So the magic is not an issue here. And the idea that we've seen the world itself will make things go how it wants, like the big magic of time looping, you can't even go anywhere unless it's on track for the story. The world itself will help you out. And if the world wants a Mad Hatter for the story, it could be helping Neo out, helping her build her illusions, helping her build this grand building, helping her with the potential to build her gang. The resources and such that would seem impossible. I don't think she's making her illusions and then they're finding brick and mortar and stone and paint and building this house. That seems ridiculous. But if she could make the house almost magically because she's being fueled by Ever After, or if she didn't do it, Ever After will simply provide it for her. Just make a new land, make a new acre that is Neo's land, and she'll just move right in. There's nothing to say that can't be done, because we have seen some crazy levels of magic already that bend the reality. So if it wants a Mad Hatter, it might be getting one, and it's simply providing for her. That actually could be plausible here. And let's get into the all-important why. Well, that question seems to be coming clear the more that's revealed about Ever After. As I just mentioned, everyone here has a role. Team Ruby, especially Ruby herself, is in the Alex role, which is you know, the Alice role, going through the story like the protagonist. Jinxie is the trickster merchant, and will seemingly always be the trickster merchant, has been doing this forever. The Red Prince must be the Red Prince, and is fulfilling his purpose, which is to win the game. That's what he has to do, that is why he exists. The beings here have a purpose and a role. So, we've also seen that at least it's hinted that Jean now has a role too, that he is a knight in the story. Whichever role he's filling, He's filling one of them, it really seems, and he seems changed by it. 
Whatever the circumstances, it appears that he too has been given part of the story, and I think that might be what's happening to Neo. I think that's what this is. Sure, Mad Hatter illusions, but more than that, I think Neo is taking the Mad Hatter role, or its equivalent in Ever After, or inventing it if it didn't exist already. Whether it be a new chapter to the story or replacing an old one, Neo is taking up this role, and that also sets her up for a collision with Team Ruby because Ruby is moving through the story. So if Neo is part of the story, that sets them on a collision course before they leave. If she has a role, if she is this boss who will become an obstacle, then the team will have to try and conquer that obstacle. Just like the Red Prince was an obstacle for them to get through, to get through that acre of land, almost like each is its own challenge, like the beach was its own challenge and so is this, Neo will be one of those challenges in her Mad Hatter realm. However, Neo is of course much more motivated as a threat and has a lot more personal investment in this. Just like they had to wander into enemy territory with the prince, I think that they're going to have to do the same here. Wander into Neo's little kingdom with her gang, especially people that they might recognize. You know, what happens when the people there are Roman, who was dead, and maybe Cinder, who they thought they left behind? especially before they know what's going on, terrifying because they don't know about this seemingly new Neo development and they don't know what they can trust in this realm at all. But while we're discussing playing a role, it's where I wanted to address the last part of this image, which is the multicolored tea, which I can't necessarily explain. There's several options. It could be several things. I thought that it might be a hint that it's illusory tea, like it's being created, almost like playing with paint, you know, it's unnatural, it's being made. I also thought perhaps that my suspicions have been that the hookah-smoking caterpillar is the one who will lead Ruby on this crazy fog-filled journey eventually, this journey of self-discovery, because that's kind of what he can do. And maybe that this is the same for Neo, that perhaps the tea is magically drugged. Perhaps every time Neo drinks the tea, it keeps her in the illusion, it keeps her in her role, perhaps. It keeps her from thinking about other things and wandering off the story. Whether that's because of the Caterpillar's involvement, or whether that's just because it had my mind on, basically, drugs. Um, there is that possibility, and there's also the possibility that I'm wrong about all of this, right? That everything behind her is not her using her illusions, that I guess a secondary little theory in here is that instead, she, this is her going on her, you know, vision quest. That perhaps the Hookah Smoking Caterpillar, in the same way, has sent her on this you know, vision quest where she has to go through shadows of her past and navigate this her wants and you know her desires you know to be a boss, things like that. That could be what it is. I'm not as confident in that one, but it is an option I do see there. But there is also a fun but very dark option I thought of, in that this is a vision of actually Ruby's test when she gets to this land rather than a fight with weapons, which you think Nia would go for, and maybe they have before, but it doesn't work out. Instead, just like with the Prince, where Ruby had to play a chess game, Ruby has to play a game here to win, to progress. And the game that I thought of is very simple, and if anyone has seen the first episode of Sherlock, you know what it is. That there is a guy who challenges Sherlock to this game. There are two drinks. In this case, it would be cups of tea. One is in front of Ruby, and one is in front of Neo. One is poisoned and will kill you. All you have to do is pick which one, and then both parties will drink, and it's entirely in Ruby's hands. See, that is an idea, that it's, okay, one of us is gonna die, but let's put it down to a challenge of wills. The trickster versus the protagonist. Can you figure out which one I poisoned? Did I do it in, for the one in front of you because that seems obvious? Or did I do it for the one in front of me because I know you'll switch them? Or do I know that you think I will have done that so I actually did it the other way, etc, etc. And of course we could mix things in like a Russian roulette of teas and trying to outsmart her. Things like this. These are just ideas that came to me when I was trying to figure out what the tea could be. But anyway, the other idea that I had is also along the similar route, but rather than poisoned, it's more... Like, it's, again, drugged, something more trippy. And it could be that that's why Ruby falls into Neo's tea here. That she falls into Neo's tea trap. It could even be, perhaps, that the team arrives here in this land, they don't know anything about it, and they are served drug tea. 
before they know it has anything to do with Neo, before they see Roman or whoever, they only see people they don't recognize who are just silent and are serving them tea. And by the time they drink it, it's too late. And then Neo walks in and then they wake up tied up or whatever. You could do something like that. Anyway, that's all getting into maybes this and maybes that. Just as guesswork and opinions. But there is a little bit more to talk about because lastly I wanted to talk about perhaps what happens in the end. You see, I think there's real danger that people who lose themselves in their role probably don't get to leave. We see this seemingly endless cycle of events that is ever after that play out again and again. Jinchi runs the same bracket over and over again. And it's acknowledged that it's seemingly happened before in the story and that Jinxi looks older than he should, as if this has just been going on over and over again. And we get that confirmed when we go to the Crimson Castle and, well, we learn that the king is no longer there because of humankind, yet the prince has taken up the role now and he has to play the game. It's what is said to him and what is said to us. The cycle continues. They have to fulfill their purpose. And while all of them you could say are ever after creations, these beings, I don't think that a person who lands in this situation necessarily will always get out of it either. And I'm really starting to think that perhaps there's a chance that this is what happens to Neo, that this is her end. That she surrounds herself with these illusions from her past. That she gets lost in the fantasy of it all. She has everything she wants. She has her parents. She has Roman back. She's the boss. She has everything. She couldn't want more, and she loses herself to become part of the Ever After story, to become the Mad Hatter of the story permanently. Now, say it with me now, she goes mad. She loses her mind to this. That's not to mention that in the real Mad Hatter, like the real Alice in Wonderland book, the Mad Hatter is, unfortunately, stuck in time. It is always six o'clock, it is always tea time. And what if that is how Neo ends? She becomes the Mad Hatter, and it's always six o'clock, she's stuck in time, it's always tea time. It seems pretty possible looking at it that way. How we deal with this character, right? So take yourself out of the story, pretend you're the writer of this story. We know that Neo was pretty much reintroduced just because she was a fan favorite, or it seems that way. And we have Nothing really for Neo to do back on Remnant for the end of the story. Her only real motivation is, let's kill Ruby and let's kill Cinder. But we are obviously not going to kill Ruby. And as for killing Cinder, as much as it might be nice for Neo to get that revenge, we have other characters who narratively, it would be more satisfying to get that revenge for us. Namely, our protagonist and or Jean. You know, for her killing Pyrrha, for her killing Penny, for everything else she's done. One of them getting that kill would mean a lot more to the story than Neo satisfying her want for revenge. So what I mean is she's probably not going to get it. So you have a character that was reintroduced because fans liked them, but you don't really have a role for them to play anymore. And now, I mean, they are still a fan favorite, so horribly murdering them might not go down well. So what if we instead do this? We give her everything she's ever wanted. You like her, but she's a bad guy, so what we'll do is literally put her in a dream. But she's stuck in it, and we have to leave her behind. She gets her happy ending, but it's almost not real, although it's real to her, so perhaps that's good enough. She gets to be the villain one last time, she has to be the big hurdle for Ruby, and they can settle their thing. And, in the end, our main characters return home, and after that one more big villain beat, no one has to die. Instead, she is left stuck in her fantasy, where she is happy. It could perhaps even be that the team do try and wake her up from it, but at that point, she's so far gone, they just can't, and they have no choice. Or they have to leave her behind because they're chased off. Either way, in the end, she's left behind. It's sad because she's gone, but it's happy because she's living her dreams, as close as she could ever get to them, at least. And then there's always that thing in the back of people's minds, well, it's not impossible to leave Wonderland, so... Maybe she does too one day. You know, enjoy fanfic writers. But for now, she's wrapped up and she's out of the plot and we can go on towards the home stretch of the big story. From a writing perspective, that's not a bad thing to assume they might have approached this as. Especially when you tie it into the allusions to the actual Mad Hatter and the stuck in time and the people playing roles here. It really could be that, yeah, Neo's ending is 
we beat her and they settle things and she lives out her fantasy in the life she never had uh, with everything she could ever want in this magical land for however long you last there. And if that is the case, perhaps then just maybe that might be when Nia was at the bottom of this painting. She is the last hurdle to beat before everything is wrapped up. And that this illusion that's here with the rest of Ever After is that she's not creating Ever After, but she might have created her Ever After. That she is wrapped up in this tale. Perhaps that's why she fades into Alex. Because now Neo 2 has become part of the story. Also, before I leave, a hint. I think I actually might know why they have to go and see Neo. But I'll save that one for a later video. For now, that's Neo's false fairy tale. An illusory fantasy of her own making. Answering how these people are here. And perhaps even what may become of her. What do you think of this theory? If it's not that, then how are these people here? And what's going on in the ever after? Would you be happy if this was Neo's eventual ending? A happy fairy tale ending, even if it is all just pretend? Is that perhaps enough to literally live the dream? Maybe that is the true fairy tale ending, but at the end of the day, that's all it is. Just a tale, and we'll have to see if it comes true. But until next time, my name is Riga. Hope you had a wonderful day, and I hope I did alright.